The gospel text for this Sunday is taken from John chapter 15. I believe it says, starting with verse 9, I'm going to back up one additional verse um, and then have that be um, added to the the, the, the scripture that we're um, going to hear today. Jesus speaks this to his disciples. These are the last words that he spoke before um, being taken, arrested, and then subsequently put it on trial and killed. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I tell you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants, for a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command. Love one another. Full stop. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As we go into the word today, I uh, invite you to pray with me. But Father, thank you for your word. Your word is life. And as we gather and go into your word more deeply today as we draw our attention to the truth that you have spoken not only to your first disciples, but also to us today. May our ears be open, our hearts be open to hear what you have to say. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I've entitled today's message, Bearing Fruit, because this is a continuation from last week and last week when we read the first scriptures leading into what we read today, it was all about bearing fruit. If you remember, uh, Jesus starts the chapter. I am the, uh, the true vine and my father is the gardener. And he cuts off every branch of me that doesn't bear fruit. What? He cuts you off. Yeah, it's just kind of a stock, stark declaration to make cuts off every branch of me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes it so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already pruned because, anyone remember? I'm a failure. <laughs> Just complete failure. <laughs> you, are, you are already pruned because of the word. The logos, you remember that, right? Please tell, thank you. Because of the word I have spoken to you. Then he says, remain in me. It's a good word, remain. Uh, a, a better English word, I think, for that Greek word is abide. Abide. It's one we don't use a lot because you can't really wrap your mind around it as well as remain, but it's a great word. Abide in me and I will abide in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. There's the fruit again. You must remain or abide in the vine or the branch. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If a man remains in me, abides in me, and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can only do a few things. Oh, good. Someone caught it. Jim's like, I know it doesn't say that. 
Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is like a branch that's thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown in the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words, Rhema, abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given you. This is to my Father's glory. And this is where he picked it up today. So the whole prep uh, verses leading up to today is all about bearing fruit. And Jesus goes into great detail describing this using the parables. He's a great teacher. He uses things that we know to reveal things that we don't know. And so this whole thing is about the fruit. And today's, like I said, message is called bearing fruit. The way that fruit is bore, if you will, has everything to do with abiding or remaining. But I like abiding because abiding encompasses that a little, a little greater. Abiding. It is through abiding that we bear fruit. And how does God abide in us? Through his word. One of the powerful things that Jesus teaches, many things powerful, but one of them that he teaches in these chapters before his death has to do with the Holy Spirit and the role. He will remind you of everything that I have said to you. Because you won't remember from one Sunday to the next. Okay. That's his role. But it's not passive. It is active on our part. You ever have to study for a test? You ever study for the test? We used to have spelling tests. I was a horrible speller. And I'd start out at the beginning of the week. You know, they, they give you the preliminary to test to see how, how much you knew. I'd get five out of 20. But by Friday... I knew them pretty well, and I'd either get 19 or 20. But if you test me the next Monday, I wouldn't know probably any of them. That's similar to God's word. Abiding. Abiding is how we bear fruit. And how does God abide with us? Through his word. As Jesus says, he, the Holy Spirit will remind you of everything I have said to you. But it doesn't rely on him alone. It's, it is active. There's participation in terms of bringing the word in. And we talked last week about the importance of his word. But the fruitfulness happens to be happens to go all the way back to Genesis where God blesses them and says, be fruitful and multiply two things. The fruitful and multiplying are interconnected and he blesses them that way. Then when he starts all over in creation with Noah or after the flood, rather with Noah, he says the same thing to Noah, be fruitful it is God's desire and his blessing for us to experience bearing fruit. And I'd like to get into this deeper because it's his word that transforms us into abiding in him. And it is his word itself that bears the fruit. Fruit, if you think about it, is basically a manifestation of the nature from where it comes from. That's why an apple tree will not bear grapes. And an orange tree will not bear apples because it doesn't come from the vine or the branch that has that nature. So when we're bearing fruit, 
We are literally developing God's nature, or better yet, his character. And that is important to understand because in our culture, it is easy to confuse character with personality. So if you have a very charismatic, charismatic personality or very eccentric, we want to see what you have to say about things. But that does not necessitate that you know anything about that person's character. And character is what defines who a person is. So this is very important for Jesus to teach because he is going into a situation shortly after teaching this in which his character will be on full display. He will be brought into trial, a mock trial, by people that do not recognize who he is and in the name of God are going to sentence him to death. And you see his character. That's why Jesus says in the same gospel, you will know who I am, not because I say it, but because when the Son of Man is lifted up, then you will know. You will see my character. But your true character can only come out during times of great duress. Anyone can be kind and happy and giving and patient when their circumstances are pleasant. But when things change and the circumstances are unpleasant and uncomfortable, then character is revealed. So as we go into this, it is his word that carries his life and his life within us through his word produces fruit. And what is the fruit of the spirit? I'm going to turn at this point, um, to Galatians, Paul gives us a good example of this in chapter 5, verse 32. For the fruit of the Spirit, this is God's nature now, his character. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those are the fruit. However, these characteristics of the fruit, when produced by the Holy Spirit, are supernatural. They go beyond what we can do from our own personalities. Jesus points this out time and time again. He says, what good is it? Even the Gentiles know how to give good gifts. They know how to be good. You know how to be supernaturally good when the Spirit will come upon you. Anybody can be good from a human standpoint and can judge one another on our goodness when we compare it to one another. But what Paul is talking about in Galatians is a goodness that is supernatural in nature. A goodness that when everyone is talking bad about you, you do not respond in kind. A patience that when your patience has run thin or you are at the end of your rope, or you can't go on any further, continues to carry you on. It is supernatural in its character. Not so much so that when we get offended, and this is defined, by the way, with regards to the whole body of Christ, because this is where we practice character development. Jesus says, as we read today, if you obey my commands, that word obey is good. I'd rather, some of your translations may say keep. I like keep because the word is tereo. It's like a keepsake. If you've ever had a keepsake, 
it's something that you, it's, it's very valuable to you and you keep great care of it and you, you don't just ignore it. You want it to be in a safe place because it has high value for you. Very similar to that. But obedience is also part of it. If you obey my commands, you will abide in my love. Just as I have obeyed my father's commands and remain in his love. I tell you this so that my joy may be in you. Supernatural joy. Not a joy of, man, the humdrum, humdrum life that I have. Let's, let's, let's create something that will give us a great deal of joy and put it on the calendar. That's a human way of trying to ascertain or pursue joy. And you probably will get some joy from it. This is not that. This is a joy that says, yeah, you know what? I have cancer. I'm still in joy. It's supernatural. Nothing formed against it can go there. It's a joy that is so deeply imprinted in your spirit that no one can take it. In that day, says Jesus, you will know me and you will have joy and no one will be able to take away your joy. How many times this week has a news program, has a talking head, has someone stolen your joy? Every day. That's because it's not of God. A or B, we have been disconnected from God in that moment. Or we're confused that what we think is happiness is God's joy, and those two things are different. One is personality. They have a really happy personality. Just bubbly. That's fine. I don't have that. I'm more doom and gloom. No, I'm not doing. Well, maybe I am. I don't know. But that's personality. Joy says, no matter what I'm going through, I can find an eternal, completely satisfying and fulfilling joy that sustains me. As the scripture says regarding Jesus, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Without that supernatural joy, we feel like we have to endure things as some kind of punishment or some kind of foul circumstance. When in reality, in Christ and only in Christ, do those situations become transformational in our character. This is so key. Because Jesus gives us life. I'm going to go to John 14, where, again, another chapter where he is teaching his disciples right before he is taken captive. And in verse 10 of that chapter, Jesus says the following words. Don't you believe, he's talking to Philip now, that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. The words I speak to you are not my own. Rather, it is the Father who lives in me who is doing his work. So the Father who abides in him speaks the rhema, the words. And as we hear them, it begins to transform us. The confusion that we oftentimes can fall into is that in this world, we do things to get a pleasant response, an immediate response. We want to feel something immediately. The word does not work like that. It transforms us in the deeper level. It goes to the deepest parts of who we are. And so as we go into the word, it's not uncommon to beginning with the word, open it. Okay, whatever. I don't feel anything. I don't feel any different. Ever have that? I'll see you. I'll be back at church two months later. Because when I turn on the TV, I feel something. Maybe I'm angry, maybe I'm happy, 
Maybe I'm stimulated. Ooh, but I feel something. Sometimes the TV itself as a medium is so stimulating that I don't even have to watch a program. I just have to channel surf. Ooh, ooh. Ever have that? Ever do that? For more than a half an hour? Anybody do that for more than half an hour? All right. How about 45 minutes? An hour? An hour and a half? Shame on you! Now that your hand's up, let's all praise the Lord. Hallelujah. That's how I get Lutherans to praise the Lord that way. Um, yeah, we want stimulus. Oh, it's lovely. Oh, it's beautiful. Oh, what's this? That's, that's fine. But that's just on the, on, the, on the fleshly level, on the human nature level. We want to be stimulated. We don't want to go to a restaurant that's nutritious. We want to go to a restaurant that has zing. And the word of God doesn't work like that. It goes to the deepest parts of us. So when we take in the word and if we are expecting some kind of, that's why you talk with pastors and, oh, that pastor, he, he was really, he or she was really into it. I, that doesn't mean anything. I've known a pastor that's given a barn burning sermon that had nothing to do with God, but I was entertained for half an hour. The word of God goes deeper than that. And everybody speaks a word. So when you're around all day people that are speaking from their own resources, their own thoughts, their own experiences, and not the word, you begin to take that in. And if sometimes then you get to the end of the day and you're just exhausted, I just... <sighs> but you get into the word, it's a different experience. It goes deeper. It, it begins to open our eyes spiritually to see things that we could not see before. And as such, it is, it is life-giving. It is fascinating. It is a source of great strength a source of great peace, a source of great patience. Because God speaks to us through his word in different manners of relationship. Sometimes he speaks to us as a father. And sometimes our father, we just want that, that a boy. But sometimes when God speaks to us as a father, he's like, no, you aren't doing that. You're not doing that. I want to do it. I want to do it. I want to do it. No, you're not doing that. You're 14. You don't know what you're doing. I do too, and all my friends are going to do it. And sometimes God will do that. Sometimes he speaks to us as a friend, as we read today. I no longer call you servants. I call you friends. Because everything that I learned, yes, Jesus had to learn because it's the human experience. Even though he's divine, he still had to go to the, through the learning curve. As the scripture said, he learned patience by what he suffered. And everything that Jesus learned, I've made known to you. Oh, and by the way, you didn't choose me. I chose you. You belong to me. It's a, it's a reassuring. It's very reassuring. Because I can walk away from God. And I know people that do from time to time. Especially if you're surrounded by non-believers. So easy to get influenced. I had a friend of mine, who oh, was a friend of Jim's too, that from 22. His family was going to go to, I think it was Cabo, the party place, Mexico. Forget all of your worries. Drink pina coladas, do, do, do. Get caught in the rain, do, 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 do. So his family was going to go free pay, free he said, no, what am I going to do? I'm going to go down there and be bored. I want to be in the word. 
He's 23. He demonstrates the excitement that can come. But see, he had to go through some stuff to get to that excitement. How excited are you for God's word? How excited am I? Maybe we need to be more connected to it. And I don't mean excited like that instant gratification. I mean that we can drink from his word. So this is all about bearing fruit. And he is the one that will bear fruit within us through his word. Our job then, if you will, or how we participate is to take in his word. You can put a plate of food in front of somebody, but that doesn't mean they're going to eat it. And so even though the word is here, I remember <laughs> I had a talk with a friend of mine back in Minnesota, still there, poor guy. No, I'm just kidding. I just missed one. Anyway, and when we were growing up, we both grew up in the same church. Yeah. They used to put the insert for all the scripture readings in the bulletin. Anyone else ever have that? Yeah, you could print them. You could go to Augsburg Fortress. And each Sunday, they'd have an insert with all of the scripture readings on it. They had to feed you like a baby. Because you can open up the Bible. Oh, that's, that's too much work. So I just put it in an insert. And I thought, well, I don't get it. I was a kid. I don't get it. Why do we have this insert? We got Bibles right here. Actually, I didn't know why, because nobody ever opened them. But they looked good, right? But the thing of it is, the Word is like spiritual nourishment. How long can you go without food? And if you don't go, I mean, even if you're going to skip a meal, you can get pretty cranky. I can tell when certain <laughs> members of my family have not had something to eat. Yeah, I should just, just get a, a supply of snacks. And when somebody comes home, just throw snacks at them. I want to deal with it. It's the Snickers commercial. Have you seen the Snickers commercial? Yeah, that's what happens when you don't eat. You don't have something in your stomach. It's the same with God's word. If you're not consuming it, if you will, or digesting it. That's why he says, uh, talking to the Jewish people, they, they were referring to manna. He says, I'm the manna, I'm the bread. Well, what do you do with bread? Don't just look at it. You consume it. And, when the, and in the case of manna, you don't consume it once a week and then just stuff your face and then go through the rest of the week and think that's going to get you through. You would get the manna daily. Give us this day our daily bread. It's the same with God's word. There was a reason why God's, Jesus' first disciples had to be pulled out of their life to follow him so that they could learn how to be in the word daily. So when they went back to their life, they wouldn't forget that experience and go right back into the Jewish rat race. There's a reason why God says in making a covenant with Israel that you are to take the Sabbath, the sixth day, and do nothing because then you can focus on my word. And we have taken that particular command and thrown it out the window. We just did church every Sunday. That doesn't know. Not if I have a softball tournament or a swimming tournament. <clears throat> and we just went right along with it. I said, oh, well, <laughs> I guess they're having fun. You see? And then once they're, that generation is disconnected from the word, it's gone. So staying connected in the word is how God bears fruit in our lives. And why is that important? Because we're God's family and we are going to reign with him. And you can't give people responsibility if they don't have character. You just can't. You can't give anybody responsibility if they don't have character. That's why we don't allow 13-year-olds to marry. They don't have the character yet. 
That's why we hold off on certain ages for certain activities because they don't have the character. And God is saying, I'm developing within you. Everything that you're going through is not to punish you. Everything that you're going through is not because I've abandoned you. Everything that you are facing is not because I'm throwing you in the deep end just to see what you can do. No, what I'm doing is developing character. And you must remain, abide in my word. I'll tell you one thing as a, as a human being trying to do this discipleship things. I am closest to God when I am suffering. I can't tell you how many times. Can you give me a book? I'm going through a lot of this. I'm, I'm going through whatever it is. But as soon as they ain't going through that, eh, and we wonder why spiritually we don't have the, the fortitude. And, I, and, and, and I, I'm, I'm done judging. I do the same thing. The biggest danger in my life spiritually of everything, the greatest danger I have for me is comfort. And what do we strive for? Comfort. I want to feel comfortable if I'm doing this ministry. I want to feel comfortable coming to church. I don't want to be challenged. You want me to be challenged? Don't go to a gym. That's right. Exactly. So the thing is, what Jesus is teaching what Jesus is revealing is the importance of his word and the blessing that comes from it and the transformation that will take place. Peter goes from being Peter, normal man, to being somebody that on one hand would deny his, his best friend, his savior, his Messiah, when confronted by a, a little girl to a person that will speak the truth to Jewish leaders that would have him killed. That's character. And my friends in Christ, this is what God is doing in us. Each one of us. It's a blessing. It's a calling, actually. It's a purpose that has no other equal. It is the way in which God will reveal the truth of his word and instill in us a joy and a peace that is supernatural in nature. Supernatural. As we said yesterday, we will grieve in this world, but we will not grieve as the world does because we have his word in us. It is a source of strength. It is a source of comfort and it is a source of hope. So my friends in Christ, may the word of God dwell within you richly and may you grow in his word and find your strength and life in his word and may he abide in you through his word. Amen. Our sermon hymn.